Okay, good morning everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started today. Welcome to lecture this Wednesday morning. Finally a little cooler outside. Hope you guys had a good long weekend with the holiday. Um, I don't have any classes on Monday, so I didn't actually benefit anything from having the day off. Hopefully, hopefully you guys did. Um, just a few quick announcements. Homework is due tomorrow in recitation. Um, there's the problems listed there again. I apologize to know a few of you were having some issues finding those problems. They're posted on Carmen as a news item. So when you go into the 1450 page, if you um, just there on the home page, there's a, a column there of announcements. Uh, every time I send you guys an email, I also post a version of that there. And uh, Dr. Baker posted the homework problems there, and I'm not sure if they were anywhere else. But uh, anyway, those are due tomorrow. Had another question come in. Uh, is jump required for the homework? Absolutely not. Uh, we're just using jump as uh, one, one example of technology you could use for uh, analysis in this class and trying to demo it for you so you can get a little bit of a understanding of what it's like there. Um, but if you'd rather use Excel or some other technology um, or even draw things by hand or use a calculator, whatever, you're, wel you're welcome to do that. Jump is just designed to make your life easy and um, I realize <laughs> some of you have had problems getting on your computer so maybe you don't feel like it's making your life easy. But uh, later, later in the course we'll, we'll use it a little bit more. Um, but anyway, Jump is not required for the homework. You're welcome to use it. I would encourage you to use it but um, do whatever works for you. Um, and one other note that came in, I, I sent an email about this. Sorry, there was a little bit of confusion. Um, the, there, so there are three lecture sections of, of this class, including this one, each of which originally had its own Carmen page, um, but those should have been put together. So there was, those were merged over the weekend, which I know caused some different notes to be, to be uh, so whatever I had on my course was completely erased, and uh, notes for the other lecture sections were posted. Um, so that should be fixed now. There's a section on the content page of, of things that are specific to this class, so check there. Um, we're going to use, uh, so we had some, some organizational things going on at the beginning of the term here. The first six chapters will be notes that are already posted online, and then, we'll, then I'll switch over and use the notes that the other two sections are using as well. Um, so sorry for the confusion, I'll keep you guys posted on, on that when we get there. Any questions on the homework or issues on Carmen or anything like that before we get going here? Okay, great. Well, thank you guys all for your patience on as we're getting started here. I think things should be getting more and more smooth as we as we go along here. So we're going to pick back up with chapter three today. I uh, remember we were talking about the normal distributions, and uh, hopefully we'll finish up this this section of notes today uh, and be ready to move on next time. So just to remind you of what we're talking about here, um, the normal distributions are a particular family of density curves. We talked a lot about density curves on Friday. Um, being kind of a smooth way to um, sort of a smooth curve that you could think of as a histogram uh, for some other some other things, um, but they have some some general properties. They're always above the they're always positive. They're always above the horizontal axis. The area underneath the curve has to add up to one. Uh, some of those kind of things that we looked at, and then we're going to spend most of our time talking about this particular family of distributions, the normal distributions, which have this this bell shape that you can see up there. Um, they all, all, all um, cur density curves in this family sort of have the same properties. They're, they're bell-shaped, um, symmetric, they have one peak. Um, and then just to remind you, the notation that we're going to use here is this capital N with a mu and a sigma. And that's going to um, denote a particular normal distribution with a certain mean mu and standard deviation sigma. So that's going to be our notation, and I'll, I'll use that here in what follows. Uh, just to refresh your member, memory, that uh, so the mean, the mean of, of the of the density curve of the normal curve is located right there in the middle. Remember, it's a symmetric curve, so the mean is going to be right right there in the middle. We talked a little bit about this on on Friday, but you can we can shift around the normal curve by by changing changing the mean. So we can take this red curve and we can shift it over to get that to get that blue curve. So I'm just picking it up and moving it over a little bit. Um, can anyone tell me what the mean mean is for the for the red curve? So what is my mu for this one? Can anyone? I think it's visible. Negative five. negative five. Right. So we're looking right here, right here in the middle. So my mean is negative five here. And what about what about my mean for the blue curve? Maybe not quite as obvious. Three. Yeah, or, or three or something like that, right? So it's we're going right right here in the middle. 
I think that's a three. So the mu, the mean here is actually going to be three. So again, we haven't changed. We haven't we haven't uh, changed the standard deviation. Kept that the same. We've just changed the mean, and that that results in picking the the distribution up and moving it over by eight units there. So that's a shift. We can change the change the mean mu, and we'll get a shift. Um, similarly, we can we can rescale or we can stretch the normal distribution. So um, we can go from uh, this colors are a little weird on there. We can go from this this taller curve down to the more shallow curve by changing the um, standard deviation. And just from looking at a picture, you can't tell exactly what the standard deviation is. But um, I think sigma up here was like 1.5, and down here sigma was 3 or something like that. But the point being that the 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 one that's more smashed down is more spread out, right? So that means that the um, the standard deviation is going to be bigger. Remember, the standard deviation mem uh, measures how spread out the distribution is. And so being more spread out means that it has a more spread and, and a bigger standard deviation. And, that's, and we're going to call that a, a rescaling, or we can stretch the distribution um, in, in one way or another. And then, of course, uh, as we looked at on, on Friday, we can also do both. right? We can, we can both shift it and rescale the distribution. Um, so we can go from starting with the pink curve, we can, we can rescale it down to the red one, and then we can shift the red one over to the blue one. So again, this is the same, same thing, just combining the two slides uh, previous into, into kind, of one, kind of one step. So that, that's, that's what I mean by the family of distributions, that, that uh, each one has its own mean and its own standard deviation, and we can change those things, and the, the curve will look different, but they're, it's still essentially the same thing, still has the same properties. Um, so then we, a few, uh, one of the other properties we talked about for normal distributions was this, this uh, seemingly arbitrary collection of numbers, 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And that simply corresponds to um, the fact that we have 68% of the data within one standard deviation of the mean. So, so this range right in here is within one standard deviation of the mean. So I'm going up one standard deviation and down one standard deviation. And that has 68% of the data. If I go a little further, if I go two standard deviations up and two standard deviations down, so in this range here, then I have 95% of the data. And then if I go all the way out to three standard deviations, that's going to be 99.7% uh, of the area under the curve. So almost all the area of the curve falls between um, plus and minus three standard deviations there. So that's simply what I mean by this, this rule that we're talking about. And then we use this rule to, uh, to look at some examples. So um, the example we looked at was about a particular species of bat here in Ohio. And we, were, um, we picked out this key phrase, the distribution of, we're looking at the wingspan of this bat, the distribution of those wingspans is normal with mean 25 and standard deviation uh, 0.83 centimeters. So again, what that means is the, the wingspans of the little brown bat uh, are normal with mean 25 centimeters and standard deviation 0.83 centimeters. So that's my mean. This is my standard deviation. So again, just going with that notation that I, that I introduced a little bit ago and, and, showed, and um, showed you, this, that's, that's what we would do for a particular example. We can just pick out the mean and the standard deviation, and we can write it, write it down like that. And then we used, we used this information to answer a few questions, right? We said, uh, we wanted to know what, what range of wingspans covers 95% of this distribution. And so I think drawing a picture is always a good idea. So if our normal curve, if this is our normal curve there on the right, um, we wanted to know what, what those two question marks were, um, such that 95% of the area is between. Going back to our rule, we know that, that, that we just have to, um, from the 68, 95, 99.7 rule, we simply have to go down two standard deviations and up two standard deviations to capture 95% of the area under the curve. And then we just uh, plugged in what those numbers were. We, have, we know that the mean is 25 and the standard deviation is 0.83. So again, we just plug those in to get our two, um, our two endpoints there. So that, um, 
So that right here again is 23.34 and right here is 26.66. And uh, so this is again still all review and then we can ask a similar question. Uh, it's a little more tricky here maybe, but what percent of the little brown bats have a wingspan less than 24.17? Um, well, we can see, we can figure out that 24.17 is one standard deviation below the mean. So if we want to know this, this area here, we can again kind of use the rules. We know that um, the middle part of that area is 68%, so that each tail, each, each side of that, uh, outside of that is, is going to be half of the remaining area, or about 16%. Um, so again, this is all things we've done before. I just wanted to refresh you on what we're doing. Um, but what if, what if I have a question, what if I have some other questions that I'm, that I'm interested in asking? Um, or actually, maybe, maybe let's just go back here. Is, is this clear for everybody? Is this making sense, kind of what we're doing? You guys have any questions you can think of? All is quiet on the back channel so far today. Okay. So like I said, we, can, uh, we might want to know some other questions. So what if we want to ask something like, what percent of the little brown bats have a wingspan of more than 23.5 centimeters? Or maybe I want to know what percent have them between 23.5 and 26, or I could pick any other number there. Oh, I do have somebody on the back channel. Excellent. Just no questions. That's good. Um, so I, I could, I want, what if I want to know something about, something about these questions here? Um, does anybody, anybody have a strategy with, that we might want to try? <coughs> Or is there a problem? Are we can, can we do this? Do we do we know how to do this? So so what did we do? What did we do in these previous examples? Um, well, let's let's go here. Maybe twenty four point one seven seems like kind of an arbitrary number. Um, but as it turned out, that was one standard deviation below the mean. So we were able to do something with that. We have, the, we have this rule that, we, that we're talking about um, that allows us to answer questions like this. But when we have, when we have numbers like 23.5 and 26, uh, that do doesn't correspond exactly to a certain number of standard deviations away from the mean. So, so none of those values are, are exactly 1, 2, or 3 standard deviations away from the mean. So we have to, we have to do something else. So I, that wasn't supposed to be a trick question, but, but the answer is no, we, we don't know how to solve these questions yet, but we, but we can. Um, and uh, so, so let's look at that. Um, someone just ask, okay, never mind. <laughs> um, all right, so. <clears throat> so just to remember, we, we've, we've been talking about already this morning again that, that all normal distributions have the same properties. Um, and so, because of this, if we, if we simply measure how many standard deviations away from the mean we are, we can, uh, we can kind of use similar, similar tricks as well. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're going to standardize the values we have in, in any normal distribution. So whatever, whatever distribution that we're, we're looking at happens to be, um, we can standardize them by first subtracting off the mean of the distribution and then dividing by the standard deviation of the distribution. And that's called, that's going to be called standardizing the, the values. So to do that, uh, we can, here's, here's a more formal way of saying that. Um, so if x is an observation from, from some distribution with mean, mu, and standard deviation, um, our standardized value is going to be uh, this, this z. We're going to use the notation here, z. And so we're going to subtract off the mean and we're going to divide by the standard deviation. And that's going to allow us to standardize this, this number x. So again, kind of formalizing what I just said on the previous, previous slide. And uh, quick note there, we could standardize values from any, any example that we have, uh, but we'll focus mainly on standardizing when we're looking at something with a normal distribution. So, Again, what we're talking about in this chapter, we can we can use these use these tricks as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
and that give, that's going to give us something that's called the uh, that's called the standard normal distribution. Um, I'm getting a note coming in that the notes on Carmen are a little different than the order that I'm going in here. I went back and I filled in a few extra extra slides. Hopefully that wasn't confusing, but we should be we should be back on back on schedule now. Um, sorry sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so that so if when we standardize when we, we when we standardize our our numbers, that gives us something called the standard normal distribution, and by standard I just mean that it has it has mean zero, and standard deviation one, and so that's why we're using this. Um, n zero comma one because it's a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one. So if I start with a number x that has a normal distribution um, with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, um, if I standardize if I standardize the value using that formula that we that we just looked at, um, that will give me something that has the standard normal distribution. So if if x is normal with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, then z will be normal with mean zero and standard deviation one. So if we think about what's going on here. Um, if I subtract the mean, that means I'm changing. That means I'm changing the mean, right? So kind of like that first slide we looked at. That just means I'm I'm picking up the distribution and just shifting it around one way or the other. And, uh, and so I will change my distribution, but I'll still have a normal distribution, is the point. And again, then that next step we looked at was if I rescale the distribution, if I, dividing by sigma in, involves um, changing the standard deviation, um, that's going to rescale my distribution. So I'm going to either squish it together or spread it out based on what sigma is. And again, I'm changing the distribution, but I still have, I still have a, a normal distribution. Um, it's just going to be scaled and uh, and shift it around until it has mean zero and standard deviation one. So, so that's all. That's all that's going on here. I'm just changing the mean, changing the standard deviation, but I still have a, I still have a normal distribution. And so, this is the tool that we're going to use. So, so, so while this rule that we mentioned is is helpful for the rare case where you need to know something about um, numbers that are exactly one, two, or three standard deviations away from the mean, um, that's not going to be that's not usually going to be the case. So we can use, we're going to use the standardizing to answer a more general type of question here. <clears throat> and, uh, and actually what we're going to use, uh, so instead of actually um, doing these things by hand, we're actually going to use a table. Um, so I will demo how to use this, but it's, it's in the back of your textbook. It's called Table A. Um, and you can, al you can also find this table on the internet uh, if you just type in if you just type in standard normal table in Google, that will pop up this table as well. <clears throat> so if you have your laptop and want to take a peek at what that is, <laughs> go for it. All right, so, so we need to first talk about cumulative proportions here um, and before we can really get into what we're talking about. And uh, the cumulative proportion here is the definition for you for whatever value that x that I have down here is the proportion of observations uh, that are less than or equal to x. So here is my number x. And if, if I shade it on this number line, those are the numbers that are less than or equal to x, right? So I'm getting smaller on the on the page uh, on the on the x-axis there. And so the the cumulative proportion here is just going to be this this area under the curve that corresponds to those values less than less than x. <clears throat> so if you guys you guys I know you guys all love uh, cumulative exams, right? Which means, that, yeah, no, we all love, hate those, right? Uh, but that, if you think about it, that means uh, a cumulative exam covers all the material up to the point that you're at right now. So if you have a cumulative final exam, that means it covers the entire semester or something, right? So you can kind of think of that as the same, same thing here. The cumulative proportion is all the numbers smaller than and up to the, the number that you're, that you're interested in, that number x, whatever that happens to be. Maybe that's a way to remember what we're, know what we're talking about here. All right, so, so now that we have, have that terminology, we're ready to kind of talk about our general strategy for, for answering these questions when we want to know something about a number that's different than one, two, or three standard deviations away from the mean. So uh, I think this is written in your notes, uh, and this is a good, a good strategy in general for um, answering these questions. First of all, it's always good to state the terms. 
uh, state the problem in terms of, of whatever variable that we're talking about is. So I'll show you what I mean by that. And then draw a picture. Uh, and of course, you don't have to draw a picture, but I highly encourage you to draw a picture. Um, I don't know. I, I'm a visual learner, and that really, really helps me. Uh, and I think it can really clarify what, what, what we're asking for there. Um, OK, so we'll draw our picture. Then, then our second step is going to be standardize the variable x. So whatever, whatever we're starting with. Uh, in the previous exam example, that was the wingspan of the little brown bats. That was our x variable. Then we can standardize that by subtracting the mean, dividing by the standard deviation. Um, and that's going to give us something with standard normal distribution. And then we can use table A to figure out what, what the proportion of what, what the area under the curve that we're interested in finding is, is going to be. So let's, uh, let's, let's go back to our example, and I'll, I'll show you more of what I'm talking about. I think this will make more sense when we, um, when we actually do an example here. So again, going back to those, those secondary questions that I ask, again, we're talking about the, the wingspans of little brown bats. And we know that that has mean 25 centimeters and standard deviation 0.83 centimeters. And now the question that we want to ask is, what percent of little brown bats have a wingspan of more than 23.5 centimeters? All right, so the problem has already sort of been stated in terms of what we're, what we're talking about, right? We have, so this, this wingspan, um, let's let x equal the wingspan. So for any, any uh, little brown bat that we might, might look at, um, it's, it's, uh, the distribution of its wingspan is going to be a normal distribution. And then the question we're asking, again, I, th I think it's helpful to draw a picture. So let's sketch out a normal curve here. Oh, that's horrible. And we can fill in a few things. We know that, it's, we know that the center of this curve um, is here at 25. And I'm going, to put a, I'm going to put an x over here next to the, uh, next to the x-axis there to indicate that 25 corresponds to the wingspan of the little brown bat. <clears throat> so know that that's its mean. And the question here is asking us what percent of little brown bats have a wingspan of more than 23.5 centimeters. So 23.5 is maybe, oh, I don't know, down here. And so which... Uh, which direction do I want to shade? What's, what's, the, what's the area under the curve that we're interested in? I'm seeing some pointing, pointing to the right, right? So we want, we want to know a percent of wingspans who are, uh, have a wingspan of more than 23.5 centimeters. So that corresponds to this area up here. This area here is what we are, is what we are interested in finding. So now the problem is that, yeah, 23.5 is not exactly uh, one, two, or three standard deviations away. So we're using our other strategy here. Um, and the next step, as you can see, look up in your notes, says we want to standardize to restate the terms and problems of the standard normal variable. So uh, we're going to take, we're going to find a z. z equals um, x minus mu divided by sigma. So we can take uh, the x that we're interested in here, 23.5. Subtract off the mean of 25 and divide by the standard deviation of point, point 0.83. So x in, the, x in this formula is whatever value we're interested in. So here it's 23.5. Um, next press question will be 23.5 and 26 we'll look at. Um, so if you plug this into your, and again, let me just denote that this is x minus mu divided by sigma. <clears throat> And so if you actually calculate out what that is, that's going to give us a negative 1.81. So I'm going to add something to my picture here to, to maybe help this, help this make sense. If I draw, if you can pretend I have another axis down here corresponding to the same curve there, and this is going to be my, my z axis. Um, I know that the, the normal curve is centered at 0. And now I've just found that this corresponding point is negative 1.81. So you can think about those are kind of representing the same thing. I'm just kind of changing my scale. And we're um, changing the, I'm shifting and I'm rescaling to get down to my z there. <clears throat> Everybody OK so far? Is this, is this feeling OK so far? 
Okay, so so now I'm ready to do that last step of the of the um, algorithm that we have here. Is then I want to use table A to find to find what this area is. So if you've printed out the notes, um, I think at the very back there there will be a, a full list of of table A from your textbook, and this is just a little a little snapshot of this um, of this table. And what what this says it's giving us here is is it's giving us a cumulative proportion. Um, so I'm going to draw another picture up here. If I have my normal curve up here, and I pick a particular z value, so whatever my z here is, this table the table will give me this area. So I, I, let me explain a little bit more what this table means. So the table will give us cumulative proportions, and for a particular z value, uh, we can we can find our value on this table here, and then inside the table will give us our uh, cumulative proportion that we're looking at. So again, jumping back here to uh, remember our our z that we're interested in is negative 1.81. So what we want is z equals negative 1.81. And uh, and what? Uh, let, let me rewrite this negative 1.81. This is negative uh, 1.8 plus um, 0.01. That's maybe one way to just kind of. I'm going to split that out there to kind of show you what I'm looking at. Um, and so now I will uh, take take this. I'll take this number here and look for it over in the the column on the the far left there. And I will take this other part of the number and look for the for the row in the top there. So I'm going to pick out, and I, again, I have a negative floating around there. I keep that in mind. So I go down here, and I find uh, here's my negative 1.8. And uh, this arrow, I guess, should actually be pointing over here. So here's my point, point zero 0.01. So again, I have negative 1.81. I want to find the, you can think about it as sort of the tenths place in the column on the left, and then the hundredths place in the um, row along the top. And so then I simply need to trace down and figure out where those, where this row and column intersect, so I can go over and come down and pick out this number right here, because that's that's the column that that's the column that I'm in and the row that I that I wanna that I wanna be in. Um, so let's let me redraw this picture, I guess. So what we're what we're looking at here is I have my normal curve. Uh, here's zero. Down here is negative one point eight one. And what I've found now is that this area is equal to point zero three five one. So the number that's inside the table gives me that cumulative proportion that we're looking at there. So because because this 3.51 is here, that means that the area that I've shaded in there is 0 0.0351. Yes, sir? Great question. So will Z ever go outside this range? Uh, it certainly could, yes. Um, so if Z goes outside this range, um, then, then we'll have a situation that's sort of not hard to deal with. So um, let me let me come back to that. Well, no, I guess let me just draw a quick picture here. So, so let's so we have the smallest number we have on here is negative is negative three point four. Um, so what that means is that uh, if I have a normal curve down here, and down here is negative three point four. Well, this is a not a very good picture. <laughs> so if, if down here is negative 3.4, that means that the area that I've shaded in there is point, point zero, 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 0.0003. Um, that's what the table, table tells me, 3.4. Sorry, I'm completely out of space here. <laughs> 3.40 is what I have there. So if I, have a, if I have a number that's smaller than that, if I have something that's, say, 
uh, out here at negative 4 that I want to know about, that area will be less than 0 0.0003 because I, I want to know just this area out here. So it'll essentially be 0 is, is my point. So if you have a number that's, that's smaller than something that's showing up on the table, then the cumulative proportion is pretty much 0. And uh, same on the other end, which we'll look at in a second here. If it's big on the other end of it, then, then you have pretty much all the area under the curve, and you have pretty much a 1 um, there. Does that, does that make sense? Did I? OK. And, and I'll, I'll point that out again when we, when we uh, um, go to a next example. But great question. All right, so a few questions came, on, came in through the back channel. So where did I get the point zero 0.01? Um, I think that comes from the z that I'm interested in here is negative 1.81. Um, so maybe, maybe a better way. Hmm. Uh, so what I what I have here, uh, this is a negative one point eight zero uh, minus point zero one. So you can think of it, think of it that way too. That's exactly the same as what I just wrote. Um, and so the point oh one comes comes from the hundredths place of our calculation over here being a being a point one. So because I have a point eight one there, that's where I get the point oh one. And then another question, why are they broken up? Is it for the purpose of the table? Or is it always that way? I think, why is the table broken up into parts? Um, yes, it is just for fitting on sheets of paper. So um, I think if that meant, why, are the table, why is the table broken up into two sheets? Just because we have to um, show them that way. Maybe that's not the question. Correct me if that was not the, not the question. Um, but anyway, so, so now so we'll do some more examples. This is, this is tricky stuff. Um, but let's let's finish out the example so you can see what I'm saying. So what I've what I've found now. Again, remember that I found this. I found the shaded in area to the left. I have the cumulative proportion there, um, shaded in. So that what that means is that this area here is point zero three five one. So we're not quite done, right? Because what I actually want is the red area. Um, so. Uh, again, we can use the, the little, what we have listed here in our um, step three is that we can use this fact that the total area under the curve is one. Um, so I try to keep, so if I, want, if I want the red area, that's going to equal one minus the blue area. Because all the area under the curve equals one, so I kind of kind of want the other other side of the other side of the curve. Um, and this is going to equal one minus point zero three five one, which means that the red area here is point um, nine six four nine. So again, here my question mark. I can now erase that, and which, and now I know that this is equal to zero point nine six four nine. Thank you. I think I think maybe I misunderstood the question, but I think some somebody just submitted a response. So thank you. <clears throat> All right, have I completely confused you? Is, is you guys, are you guys with me? Can you think of any questions on what I'm doing here? So the point nine six is the final area? Yes, is thank that, you. Is that the percentage? Yes, so, so the question, excellent, excellent point, yeah. So the, the question does say, what percent of little brown bats have wingspan more than 23 centimeters, 23.5 centimeters? And the answer here is 96.49%. And it does ask for a percent, but in general, you can give either the percent or the proportion. So either one of those is fine. So 96.49% is equal to 0.9649, if you're writing it in decimal form. Great question. All right, well, let's do, let's do another. We have the other half of this question to answer, which will give us some more practice. 
Um, so again, I can ask the same question, what, what percent of my uh, little brown bats have a wingspan between 23.5 and 26? Again, let's remember that x here is the uh, wingspan of the little brown bats. And then let's and then let's draw the picture. So here's our normal curve. Here's x. It's centered at 25. That's our mean. And what we're interested in down here is 20, uh, 23.5. And up here maybe at 26. And we want the percentage of of wingspans that are between that are between those two values. So we want to shade in the area between those two values. This is, this is what our goal is here. All right, so again, so we've, we've thought about our question in terms of the original variables. We've driv drawn a picture. Now we're ready to standardize. So our z is going to equal, again, it's x minus mu divided by sigma. So for our first value, we've already found what this is, right? We took 23.5 minus 25 divided by 0.83 and got a negative 1.81, same as before. Now we need to do this for both values. So we can take, again, same formula, x minus mu divided by sigma, 26 minus 25 divided by 0.83. And if you punch that in, you'll, figure, you'll find that this is uh, 1.20. So again, draw my other axis down here. This will correspond to my z. I know that it's centered at 0. Now I found that this is negative 1.81, and up here is 1.20. And these are supposed to correspond exactly up here. All right, so the area that we're trying to find is now a little more complicated, but we can still use the same tools that we used before. Um, we already found, let's uh, not do this whole thing again, we found that this is equal to 0 0.0351. Um, now we need to go over and check for the other z value that we have here. So let's, let's go back to our table. And now I'm looking at the other, another, another part of the table. I'm conveniently picking out the parts that I need here. And so, so the question that I completely missed was that um, why are they broken up? So why, are we, why do we have um, half of the number here, sort of, and half of the number in this top row? And that's just how the, that's just how the, table, is, that's just how the table is designed. So um, I'm sorry that, I, sorry that I missed that earlier. Um, but this is just so that I can find, find the number that I'm looking for a little more, a little more easily. Um, all right, so again, I'm going to draw my picture here. This is my z. I want to know something about 1.20. So my z is 1.20, which again is 1.20 plus 0 0.00. Kind of trivial there. So again, I can split my number into those two parts. Um, and I can take this 1.2 over to this, this uh, first column on the left. And then I can look for my 0.0, .0 in the row along the top. Again, I can come down here to the 1.2 row. So I'm, so I'm in this row here. And I, my hundredths place is going to be this 0, 0.0 here. So again, I can trace down to where, to where those, that row and column intersect. And I see that uh, the number I have is maybe kind of hard to see there. But um, it says 0. 0.8849, which means that this area here is 0.8849. Is it making sense? Fe feeling a little more comfortable how I got there? Okay. So let's now that we have that number in hand, um, let me get a different color here. Um, so what I found is that this green area, again, all the area below 1.2, uh, that is 0.8849. So again, we want the red area, and we can uh, we can find that using this this information that we have. So the green area 
is is almost what we want, but we've included a little bit too much, right? We've included all the air, all the numbers less than negative uh, 1.81 as well. So if we want just the red area, we can subtract off that little that little blue part there at the tail, and that's going to be 0.8849 minus 0.3. Uh, sorry. 0 0.0351. So by, again, we want just the red area, so we're going to take um, all the numbers up to 1.22 and subtract off the numbers that are below negative uh, 1.81. And if you calculate that out, the answer will be 0 0.8498. So again, let's finish out. The question is asking us what, what percentage of little brown bats have a wingspan between 23.5 and 26? And the answer to that question is what we've just found. So the, the percentage is 84.98%, or we could just say 0.8498. Now the questions came in, will we, will we be using a table like this during exams? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we're not going to make you memorize this table. That would be cruel and unusual. So for exams and anything like that, you will always have access to a table like this, should you need it, which you will. <laughs> All right, so another, another time through this example, um, any, any questions you guys can think of on what we're doing here? Okay, so as, as we get a little more complicated here, maybe, maybe I'm convincing you the value of drawing a picture um, to kind of keep straight exactly what it is that we want to find here. All right, so if you remember back to the, the uh, first part of that previous example we did, um, so what we've done so far is we've, we've uh, given a range of values. So we've said, you know, what percentage of... of Wingspans are, are more than 23.5 or are between some, some range of numbers. Uh, we can also go sort of, we can do these steps sort of backwards. So um, another thing that we may want to do is find a, a particular range of values given some proportion. And, uh, and we'll kind of use table A backwards. Um, so again, similar, similar steps, state the problem, draw a picture. Um, now we'll flip steps two and three. So now we want to use the table first. And then, and then unstandardize here. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, to, for, to go from, from Z back to, back to X. Um, so in reversing these steps, this unstandardizing here is, is what we have here. So um, again, remember that my Z was equal to uh, X minus mu divided by sigma. And if you break out your algebra skills from, from some time in your past, you can kind of solve, solve, solve this bottom equation for x, and that will give us, give us what we have up here. So that's, that's all I'm doing there to kind of go back and forth between x and z. We went from x to z, now we want to go from z back to x. So let me show you what I mean by this type of a question. We're going to change our example here now. Uh, we're going to keep with the animals, though. So now we're going to talk about um, adult male English Springer Spaniels. Um, I don't know if we have any dog, peop dog people in here. I'm, I like, like dogs myself. Um, so, uh, so what we're going we're gonna to assume here that the the uh, the distribution of the weights of these English Springer Spaniels is approximately normal, with with mean 52.5 and standard deviation 2.5. So if I let x equal the weight of an adult male. English Springer Spaniel. I'm going to get lazy there. ESS English Springer Spaniel. Um, then I'm going to say x is normal with mean 52.5 and standard deviation 2.5. Kind of using that notation that we've been looking at in this section. All right, so then the question that I might be interested in, so far we haven't done anything new. Uh, now the question that I, that I might want to look at is, below what weight do the lightest 10% of adult male English Springer Spaniels weigh? 
All right, so again, I'm going to first draw my picture. I've already sort of stated the uh, question in terms of the problem. Like I said, I'm terrible at drawing normal distributions. <laughs> All right, so again, what, so who, who can help me out here? What, what area do I want to sort of shade in here to, to represent the lightest 10% of adult male English Springer Spaniels? Or in which which tail will I be looking at looking at for the two? I'm seeing some pointing to the left. So yeah, so I want to look at um, sorry. So this is my x. It's centered here at 52.5, and I want to know something about this this lightest the area that I've just shaded in there corresponds to the lightest um, dogs, right? So the, it's going getting smaller on our x-axis, and we want to want, we want this to be 10 percent or 0.100. Zero. And so now again we're back to what is this what is this question mark area there? What is that question mark that corresponds to ten percent of the area? So looking at our, our steps now we we've drawn our picture now we want to use the table. So um, when we have a question like this, uh, what we want to do is now first go inside the table. So um, look in the body of table A. It says to find the cl entry closest to the proportion we are interested in. Just reading off your notes there. Um, so now I want to now I want to search around here, and maybe you can find this faster than I can. But we're going to search around, and we're going to find. Um, let's pick out right here. So, oh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted point one. So we can land here, maybe point one zero zero three. So again, the area that I want here is this is this point, this point one zero zero. That's ten percent, and so now I need to go into the table and find the number that's closest to um, point one zero zero zero. So you you might not always find the the number exactly that you're looking for, but just find find the closest one. That's going to be just as good. <clears throat> so again, I found the number, and we can now kind of go backwards to see. What row am I in? What column am I in? That will give me the z that I'm interested in. So I'm here in the negative 1.2 row, and I'm here in the 0 0.08 column. So that means my z is uh, going to be negative 1.28. So again, I found the I found now the proportion inside the table, and now I figure out what z that corresponds to. So just looking at the row and column that I'm in. Um, so kind of in our same way, if I if I draw another axis on here, this being my z, we know it's centered at zero. What I found now that this point here is negative 1.20. So again, I went inside the table, found the number that proportion that I was looking for, figure out what z that is, and then I can fill that in. And now we're going to use that other formula that we just looked at to kind of go from a z back to an x. So we have a z. We want to know what x is. Um, remember, um, x here uh, is going to be um, mu plus z times sigma. Just filling in that equation there. We know our mean here again was 52.5. We have negative 1.20 as our z times uh, the standard deviation, which was 2.5. And work that out. That's 52.5 uh, minus 3.2. And what that gives me is 49.3. Uh, and again, we're talking about weights here in pounds, so that's 49.3 pounds. So for this example, I know that z, the z of negative 1.2 corresponds to an x of uh, 49.3. Yeah, question? Um, what does z by negative 1.28? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yeah, so that should be a negative 1.28. I think my math is still correct, but thank you. That's, that's thank you. <laughs> Good catch. <clears throat> So 
So then to finish out this question, the answer is that um, uh, the lightest, well, you can just write this out here, the lightest 10% of English Springer Spaniels um, weigh less than 49.3 pounds. So again, I wanted to know below what weight do the lightest 10% of adults weigh? And so I've now found that um, the lightest 10% of an English Springer Spaniels weigh less than 49.3 pounds. So I forgot to fill in the number, so I'm going to go up here to my x, x axis and kind of fill that, back, that correspondence back in. Thank you. Some other people caught the negative 1.28 on, on my uh, writing there. <clears throat> All right, let's do one more before I let you out of here. Um, similar question, how heavy are the heaviest 5% of adult male English Springer Spaniels? We can start speeding this up, um, drawing our picture here. This is our um, Z and this is our X. Well, actually, let me keep this as X, draw in what this Z is here. So we know that the mean is 52.5, which on Z corresponds to zero. Now I want to know the heaviest 5%, so I'm going to be in which tail, the right or the left tail? The right tail, exactly, thank you. So again, I want to know, I want to know what this number is such that this area is 5% or um, 0 0.0. Five zero. All right, so I'm going to flip over to the table. But what what value should I be looking for in the table? Should it be would it be five percent? Should it be point oh five? Everybody said no, right? So I I want I the table will give me the table gives this area right. The table gives. Remember, the table gives the cumulative proportion, which is the area up from the left up to the point we're interested in. Um, so what is, what is that, that unshaded in the area? What, how, much, how much of the curve is that? Right, this is just 1 minus, this is just 95%, right? Because the area, all the area has to add up to 95, uh, has to add up to 100% or 1. Um, so this is 95% or 0.9500. So now I can, I can flip over to the table, look for my 0 0.9500. And if I remember, I want to find the closest value. So that will just be those two values there are both the same closeness to 0 0.9500. So you can pick either one. When, the, when you're in this rare case where the number you're looking for is exactly in the middle of two, two numbers in there, pick either one you want. It's fine. <clears throat> it won't make that big a difference. Um, so let's let's go with uh, let's go with this one right here. Again, if you wanted to go with the other one, that's fine. So again, figure out that we're in the 0.05 column and the 1.6 row. So that means my z is going to be 1.65. And if you wanted to use 1.64, again, that's that's totally fine. <clears throat> So what I've found now is that this number here is 1.65. And if I want to get my x, I can just kind of use that formula, go backwards. It's going to be mu plus z times sigma. Again, the mean is 52.5. Um, z is 1.65 times sigma, which is 2.5. And this will be 52.5 plus about uh, 4.1 and that's going to give me 56.6 pounds. So again I know that now the question mark that I had up here this is actually 56.6 and uh, and so now I can maybe write out what the answer is here and we'll say the heaviest 5% of English Springer Spaniels 
uh, way more than fifty six point six pounds. So I'm going a little faster through that second time. Any any questions you guys can think of on what I'm what I'm doing here? Yeah. Mm. So is it more than or equal to, or is it just more than um, or equal to? That's that's correct. That's probably technically correct to say that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your attention. Um, I will uh, see you guys on Friday. Remember, your homework is due tomorrow. Uh, and have a great rest of the day. <clears throat>